I'm standing and these white people are pushing me over the pavement and these white people are telling me, you can't sit here, you can't go there, you can't do this, you can't. And this made me change everything in my body, just started transforming into some other being. This is where revolution started evolving, developing inside me. Solide gouwe burger hierdie week op die Golden Years is die 64-jarige Amin Hussein Saido. Amin is een van die vele Suid-Afrikaners van wie ons nie rechte genoeg weet nie. Amin en vele ander burgers het een levensgewaag vir die vryheid wat ons allemaal vandag geniet. hungry. Look like you're all hungry. Fluffy, how are you, man? You okay? Hey, boy, you're a cute cat, eh? My name is Amin. And um, because of parents of mine, that um, they always choose a second name for you. Um, and they had a second name for me, which they uh, referred to as Hussein. So when I was registered, I didn't know whether I'm Amin or whether I'm Hussein. Because at a later stage of my life, I found out in my uh, ID document, I'm registered as H Saido. So there's a whole lot of confusion here because of parents. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to dispute with parents and what they did in those years anyway. Uh, but I was born in District 6. Well, from my birth in District 6, we, we didn't stay there very long. But we moved on from there, uh, as I believe, to, to an area called Athlone. And in Athlone, we stayed in my aunt's yard, my aunt and uncle's yard, in a tent for a, for, for a spell, you know, a short space of time. And then from there, I saw ourselves moving again into another place, and I couldn't uh, understand where we were going this time. But then we moved into another place in Heisendal, also in Aslan, situated in Aslan, but we were sleeping on the floor in the kitchen of these people. Quite excited, he is, he wants some food. Okay, I'll put it up here for you. You want to be the dominant boy? You want to be the dominant boy? Okay. Ah, Flash, how are you, man? Come. Come, Flash, come. Come, Flash. My father, uh, he was an asthma sufferer. And you know, a person suffering from asthma is always short of breath and so on. But he was also a barber. And he used to work very late hours. And this impacted on his health. So this is one day he just decided he couldn't do it anymore and came home. My mother was just an ordinary housewife at home and looked after us. We were 12 children. So you can imagine the daunting task for mother that day, in those years, to be able to look after 12 children. But she looked after us. My father being that person uh, uh, that we all looked up to as our role model, uh, a very religious man. And he was into his own religious world which impacted on us also as a children because we also had to abide by these rules. They were very strict where that was concerned to give you guidance as a child. My mother had to rein us in also, but she was a very fair woman in a sense that if she had one apple, she would cut that apple to 12 pieces so that each one of us have a taste of that apple. Well, uh, when we moved in 1953 you know, into Bridgetown, it was a completely different, uh, it's a very eerie place, very dark, a uh, few houses being built, and we moved into one of them. And because everybody was scared to go out at night because it had this darkness, there was no lights in the, in the, in the whole area. So we had to wait in the mornings to run early to the shops because there was no shops also. Uh, so everything was a challenge for you. And there would be one bus, if you miss a bus and you you know, you, it's like you have to walk to work after that. So we have these, these sort of uh, scenarios, you know, where uh, um, township life uh, does really take the mickey out of you. I had to learn things, you know, because uh, when you are 12 in a family, some of us need to go out to do something, to work, to earn money, to bring it into the house, to, to put stability there, because I have a father that's not very well. But uh, we were resolute in the sense that we stood together as a family uh, because we loved one another.
you know, there was a time when we had to listen to gunshots, you know, from where we lived. Now, I'm a child of 14 years old. I didn't know about politics and people marching, but there were shots just on, on the outside of where we stayed. And the talks in the house between my parents was that the, the people were marching to town to, 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 to defy pass laws. And I didn't, even as a 14-year-old child, what is pass laws, you know? But from there, we were traumatized because we used to play in these bushes, you know, and mock cowboys and mock and wanting to be emulate a, a, a hero and all that. We used to play. And we stumbled across these people in trenches, army personnel, lying in trenches with khaki uniforms and guns facing in the highways, you know, across the highways and other people shooting them. So to me, the shocking, the shock that, uh, that, I, that I came home with, you know, of what I've what I just seen, and saying and talking to my parents, he used to tell us, don't talk about it, don't talk about it, because they had to obey the law. Um, I started getting into, 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 into rebellious type of life, you know, which was now contradictory to my way of life in my home. Here yeah, I'm standing and these white people are pushing me off the pavement, and these white people are telling me, you can't sit here, you can't go there, you can't do this, you can't... And this made me change everything in my body, just started transforming into some other being. And then the times came when I didn't want to live in my house anymore with my parents. And I started seeking shelter elsewhere. And when I started seeking elsewhere shelter, this is where revolution started. In evolving, developing in, inside me. My anger was brought to such an extent that uh, I had to do something. I think my awakening came into liberation when I saw that that police in the trenches. It started from there, because through my childhood days and through even adulthood, I, it, it always played out in my mind. Until one day in the 80s, they launched the UDF, United Democratic Front, which opened my mind a bit more, because before that already, in 1968, there was boycotts at the schools. 1976 was just a formality of when everybody's talking about. A clever boy, huh? I'm Sophia. Smart, yes. It's a girl, not a boy. This is the girl? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, 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 young lady. <laughs> my name is Ali and my surname is Abdin. Uh, my grandpa was a freedom fighter, so like, Every day you would tell me like different stories about how it was in the past eight years. It scares me because like, it, imagine like going to school I and mean, like being scared like about like the police coming into you, into the classrooms while you, you like you think like while they're teaching you. Education then was like the, the Buddha would get with the education then the, the colleges and I don't know what happened over here. No, we had children being killed here. A truck went past here and this policeman jumped out of it and they surprised the young children. They were just sitting on a wall and they opened fire on them. They thought they were protesting but they weren't protesting, they were just only two kids that was very curious, wanted to see what was going on in the streets. As you can see there the name, Trojan Horse Massacre. And here's the names of the children. Sean, Sean, Michael, Michael, Jonathan. And Jonathan. Yeah, this happened in what year? 80, 1985. 1985 it happened, yes. Everything about them, because they were children, also being caught up. The, the, the movement was introduced to us, UDF was introduced to us. It's going to be a, 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 an umbrella movement for all the, 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 the organizations that were opposing apartheid. So it acted as an umbrella body but it was also brainchild from the ANC. Then from there, from the United Democratic Front, we, we moved into different cells, which we formed, different cells to operate from. What are we going to do? 
Are we going to do the relief? Are we going to do the, uh, the, the armed struggle? Are we going to do this? But we are going to do something in the organization. And I chose where I wanted to be. Uh, so I chose to be one of those in the relief uh, to do, uh, supply humanitarian aid to, to, to the affected areas. And the job befitted me perfectly. And also for me it was very difficult to enter townships. Until one day at the, at the checkpoint when the cop said to me, after looking through my van, he said to me, Doctor, he must wear a uniform. He must wear a uniform. And then I said, oh, this guy has just given me an idea, so I got myself a, a uniform. I'm no doctor, but I got a uniform, you know, because I went to the clinic in one of the townships and I said to them, I need a uniform. You see this jacket? Yeah. It looks older. Eh? Yes. It's still dirty. It's still in his original state. <laughs> and this is how I became Dr. Arch to the people in the townships. Now you must remember I used to carry humanitarian aid and also an arms and ammunition. The second also helped me to steal Imzwetu from the hospital. Gedurende the apartheid era had a great aantal young people betrokken geraak in the politiek. Hulle was eiverig om die neerdrukkende regering uit te werk. Dit was hier die jong mense wie die hoofspelers geword het, deurdat hulle inwoners aangehet het om teen die regering op te staan. Die jong activiste was toe die primaire tekens vir die politie. Siswem Zwetun Bambu was een sulke individie. Ek en Malka Prada waar jy jy Siswem Zwetun Bambu. Saba ook Prada waar jy jy want het a full of my police, what we call our own Lala Echrote Skir. It's a man that would walk from his house with his weapon all broken up in pieces, put up into his sleeves, and he would walk towards my house, like that, in his jacket, with his weapons, because in a few seconds he can put it together, because of training. Oh, I just had to be in 1983, up at Echrote Road, get to the hospital, Kids constables were people from the township who were unemployed, who are being employed by the regime, who put up notices onto the walls and onto the trees in the township that they are going to give them employment. They shot him um, at close range and he was badly wounded. From there he was dragged you know, the boys used to take you and drag you to the Caspers and they just throw you into the back of it. You know, they, they had very little respect for life. Pumala and Osipo was the two sisters that came to me. And they said to me that the Siswe was shot. Jamao brada wa mwa yefu nwa nama polisa. Uachu wa ye wa amba, usa amba kunye na ye. And then I planned that day that I, I, I have to get this man out of here because what they do is they torture you in your wounds. They use shock treatment, electrocutions and shock treatment. They, they do that into the wounds uh, to get information from you. I took a slow walk. Just a second, next wall, I could see there is Elaine. I saw him. And what I did was I walked straight into that room without talking to anybody. I just took his file and with my back turned to, because I saw the security guys here and I got this file here and I stand with his file. <laughs> so they greeted me, more a doctor and all that kind of things. I'm just responding also as a doctor. In the 1980s, was Siswe Mzwetun Bambu geidentificeerd as een van die meest gesochte vrijheidsvechters in die Westkamp. Apartheid officiere was ingelig dat Siswe kritische informatie met betrekking to die vrijheidsbeweging aanhou. This is a road where we had constant fights with the, with the, with the security police. So what we did was I lifted him. And I said to her, you hold the crutches and you lift him on the other side. When we got to the entrance, and the bell rang there around that corner of the lift, we flew from that point into that lift to get out of there, you know. Got down there, I threw him through the back window of my car, of my van, because I took the window out before, and 
I threw him through it. You know, I said to him, come on, it's going to hurt a bit, but I need to get you away. Dit het Siswe 18 maanden geneem om te herstel, maar die politie het hom opgespoor en het een middag onverwachts vir Siswe gevang by sy plakkershuis in Nyanga. Hoe Siswe en Siswe het hom maar my was so lekker, hoe 1986, hoe 26, ska December, het hoe Tula en Mula wang aan my boel. Wat hoe Tula ek kan shots as a 47, Ibe endes agen de plong e moye duam. And and these were men they were never spoken of until today for the first time so people couldn't get to know them. How brave this man was. <laughs> Very good, I feel, you know, just to see you makes me feel wonderful. How is everybody? You still got a crash here? Yes. You still busy from those years? Yes. Oh, all the, how many children you got now? Oh, I've got plus minus 80 children. Ah, you must be joking. Yes. You only started with a few. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to meet my daughter, my granddaughter, yes. Alia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell her that you were, you were so young when you were with us. You were like them, 15, 16 year old girls. Yeah. I was just like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my height was just like her. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just so, so, yeah. just to cover us, yeah. How is things, yeah? Ach, what man. are you doing? Artist of, yeah. You know, I still think a lot of everybody. Yeah. You know, um, it's a lot of memories. Yeah. A lot of sadness. Mm. Every day I wake up, I still think of the family. Yeah. Yeah. Your mother is now gone also. Yes. You know, it's, it's really sad for me, you know, mm. that uh, all our people just passing on like that. Yeah. And um, I remember just coming here to a to, to, uh, uh, service. Yeah. And it was the last also. Yeah, and my brother, uh, yeah. you know, you know, Rian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also it's passed away. away. Yeah. Oh my That's word, okay. I did. Mm. I didn't get that notice from yeah. you. Yeah. I think we lost contact, yes. but I'm going to leave details with you today okay. so that you can always stay in touch again with me. Yeah. Yeah, you need that. Yeah. Yeah, but it's good to see you, man. Yeah, it's good to see you too. <laughs> yeah. 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 The only thing that I want the government to do is to remember all the comrades. Not my brother alone, but the comrades who were fighting for this land, for South Africa, to be, liber to be li liberated. They sent a group of men to my house. And the group of men came to tell me that you have been chosen. And I asked them, chosen for what? They said, no, you were chosen to take care of the VIP units. You are never saw this picture in a long time. Look how dad I look here. Yeah, it was a long time ago when it was Nelson Mandela's bodyguard. I think just when Nelson Mandela was released and he belonged to the VIP thing. And when Mandela was released, President Nam, they already booked me for him. We was just taking it up. This was in the city when uh, when we were uh, campaigning to release Mandela. As you can see, there are photos here of him, and people were sitting on the steps here in front of the uh, hall. This was when the Tabu's father was released, Governor Mbeki. He was also sent to me in 1987. So from the time that they arrived, uh, his father, uh, Tabo Beke's father, many others after him also, like Tokyo Sexuali arrived, Sir Ramaphosa arrived, uh, many, you know, uh, arrived after that. And um, they were all sent to me to, 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 to secure them here. Yeah. 
this journalist came one day to me and, uh, and, and wrote, wanted to write a story about me. And he said, you are a legend. I'm going to write, do an article about you. And this is how this article came about in the newspaper was all the information that I could supply him. I'd, I'd, with, with the knowledge that I've learned, I'd like to tell other youth about it so they, so they, so they, don't, they don't take things for granted, so they know the history. Mm -hmm. So, because I believe that they're like in a phase of ignorance and in order to, to get them out of that ignorance, it's like, a, like you see, it's like a zombie nation. All they want to do is be on social networks, Twitter, BBM. Like I say, talk about materialistic things where they need to know the, the history and come out mm -hmm. of it, be educated and come, come out of it, that whole zombie mode. See this picture here? This was at the airport. My Diba was going to leave somewhere and I had to take him and make sure that he's safe on the plane that he was going to fly on. With Mandela being with him every day was a... Um, it was an experience because there was lots of things that I had to attend to for him. Uh, he, had a lot of, he had a very busy uh, itinerary, you know, people from all over the world wanted to see him, visit him. So he always kept me busy. So it was like you find Bill Clinton phoning in the night, you know, at uh, 11 o'clock in the night. I had to tell Bill Clinton, you can't talk to me sleeping. You have office times. Come to wake the man in the middle of the night and then you want to speak to him. <laughs> you always ask me, how are you? How are you? Hello, son. <laughs> are you fit? I said, Dada, are you for today? Because I know we're going for a long walk, you know. It's that relationship, you know. I, work, I stayed with Madiba for four and a half years, doing those things for four and a half years. When I met him, he was very, he, he had kind ways. He had very gentle ways. He was like, he was real, you know. He was, he was a real man that one can sit down and talk to as a man not as a president, but as a human being, because of his character. Speaking and he said, you are yeah, all, all, all these things that I do, it is part of a healing process, to take my mind away from what soul uh, suppresses it in, you know, and soul things that, that is imbalancing, uh, it's an imbalance to us, as a, especially me as a person, from where I stem from, where I came from. As jij betrokken bij ons wil raak en jouw stories wil deel, moet jij alsjeblieft een e-post sturen aan thegoldenyears.sabc.co.za. Jij kan ook commentaar leveren op ons Facebookblad The Golden Years op SABC2 of tweet at Golden Years SABC2.